Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Western Washington Street Mobility Improvements meeting. We're going to give folks just a minute to come in from the waiting room, and then we'll get started. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We're just going to give folks just a minute to come in and then we'll get started on the presentation. Okay, great. We're going to start off with some Zoom instructions. Again, welcome to the Western Washington Street Mobility Improvements meeting. Um, Adam, would you take us to the next slide? Thank you so much. So for those of you for joining us this evening, this meeting is being held in English and Portuguese. Um, Roseanne will be our, in our interpreter this evening in Portuguese. Um, so to make sure that we can all hear each other's questions and answers, make sure to select the language. Um, and that you can do this by a button in your toolbar and you can select English or Portuguese. All participants are joining the Zoom meeting with muted microphones. Um, please rename yourself to include your first name and last name. After the presentation, we will open the meeting to discussion and we'll first answer any questions that come in through the chat and then move to spoken comments. You can send any of your written questions to me, Kate White, through the chat and I'll read them out loud. Um, to speak out loud during the spoken, co spoken comment section, you can select the raise hand function. You can find this by clicking on the reactions button in your toolbar. This is either at the top of your screen or at the, or the top or the bottom. And then a window will pop up with the raise hand button. We'll call on you when is your turn to unmute your, and we'll unmute your microphone. If you're joining us by phone this evening, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I'll also be helping cue folks so you'll know where you are in line. If you have any technical difficulties during this meeting, feel free to contact me either via the chat box, by email at kwhit at summervillema.gov or by phone at 617-366-7293. Adam, wanna take us to the next slide? Wonderful, so um, to welcome us this evening, I'd like to hand it over to Councillor Scott. Councillor Scott, to you. All right. Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to have this meeting. It's been a very long time coming and I'm glad to see so many neighbors uh, here tonight. And also very glad to uh, have Linda Soto here with us, uh, principal of the Argenziano. And uh, honestly, folks are coming in the meeting pretty fast and, and, and I can't keep track of everybody, but uh, uh, I'm just really glad you're here. This is uh, the start of, uh, well, this, this is the next step in our plan to hopefully get Washington Street right. Um, this started off as a conversation with one of our neighbors in 2018, uh, shortly after I got elected, talking about the ways in which Washington Street wasn't working for all of its users. Uh, the residents there, the folks coming in for uh, using some of the businesses, the daycare, the pickup and drop off. And I, I really wanted this process to be something that was driven by the deep knowledge and understanding of the folks who live in the neighborhood. And so there was a series of meetings uh, that I held back in 2018 uh, to, to get that kind of hyper-local input and uh, fed that into the mobility department. Uh, we have members of city staff from mobility department, from the engineering department here tonight, uh, who took that and then worked with MBTA and other partners to come up with a pilot project. Now, I know it's been a, a weird couple of years, uh, but in my mind, the view of a, the point of a pilot project is to learn about what worked and what didn't, uh, and then move forward with a design that, that takes that learning into account. So I'm really, what I'm really excited about tonight is to hear from you. Uh, I know that the team has some slides to show. I haven't seen those slides yet. I'll be hearing about it uh, along with you. Um, but the thing that I am uh, super excited to hear about is your priorities, your input on what worked, what didn't work, what needs to change from the design uh, as we move forward, uh, and also 
your thoughts uh, when it comes to one of the big questions um, about how much to take on on Washington Street and how long that might take. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna keep talking much longer. I'm gonna hand this back uh, to Ms. White and the rest of the staff. But again, thank you for being here. And if you don't feel like, I, I'm here for as long as you need, but I know there's a hard stop at the meeting. If you don't feel like you got heard, I do have office hours every Friday morning from eight to 10 a.m. Uh, and you can, you can reach out and give me a call anytime at 857-615-1532. Uh, but with that, thanks again for being here. And uh, Kate, why don't you go ahead and introduce the rest of the team. Thanks, Councillor Scott. Um, so I'm excited to in introduce our project team this evening. Again, my name is Kate White. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator with the Mobility Division in the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. I'm joined by Adam Polinski, a Senior Planner in the Mobility Division, and Brian Postweight, our Director of Engineering in the Department of Infrastructure and Asset Management. I'm just gonna go through a quick agenda so you all know what we're gonna get, get through this evening. We're gonna talk a little bit about a project scope and timeline, our, our work to date, and the valuation of that quick build pilot some street design options, and then really to the heart of today's meeting is to hear from you in some feedback collection. But to start us off, we just wanna learn a little bit more of who is joining us in the room today. Um, so we've got two poll questions that are gonna pop up on your Zoom screen this evening. The first is, what is your relationship to Western Washington Street? And the second is, how do you travel on Western Washington Street today? So I'm gonna give these a moment so you can take some time to answer them. Then I'll share back what we've, hear, we've heard. They're totally optional. We just wanted to make sure that we all had the opportunity to see who's joining us today in this virtual environment. So I see some votes coming in. We've got some people who live on Western Washington Street, some people who take their children to school or daycare on Western Washington Street, some people who work or own a business. I'll give you folks a few more minutes so we can get a few more answered, and then I'll share this out to everyone. But thank you for taking the time to take the poll and help us learn today who is in the room with us. Okay, wonderful. How about about 30 more seconds? And then I'll release this out. Oh, we had a good question in the chat. Um, someone asked, how can you define the boundaries of Western Washington Street? So this is from a Webster Ave to Line Street on Washington Street. And we'll get a little bit more into the details tonight of, of what that, or the, um, we'll show that on a map shortly. That's where I live. Awesome. So I am going to end the poll so you can all see some of the results. Um, so as you see, so we have some folks that live on Washington Street joining us this evening, some people who live within a five minute walk. So it looks about 50% of people selected that they live within five minutes. 17% um, listed that they live on Western Washington. 57% shared they live in Somerville. And just a reminder, this was a click all that apply. Um, so some that shared, or sorry, 13% that shared I work or own a business on Western Washington, 27% who said I take a, my child or children to school or day, daycare, and 7% who said they only travel on Western Washington Street. And so we wanted to ask you today a little bit about how you travel in Western Washington. We had 43% say they use public transportation, 63% say that they bicycle, 83% say they walk, 67% say they drive or carpool, and 17% says they, they use Uber, Lyft, or taxis. And we have a couple who said other. Thanks so much for taking the poll this evening. I'm now gonna hand it over to my team member, um, Adam, who's gonna walk us through the project overview. Thank you, Kate. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be here and excited to get into the details of this project with you. I will try to be as brief as possible so that we can hear from everyone um, and, and get as much feedback as possible tonight because that's really what we're here for. Uh, but with that, we do want to set up some boundaries and make sure everyone is clear on the scope and timeline of the process, uh, some of the work that's been done to date, and then talk through um, some different options uh, as we see them um, for Western Washington and what we might accomplish in this project. So starting off here, with the limits of work. Um, as Kate mentioned, Western Washington Street, as, as we've sort of colloquially defined it, is from Webster Ave over to Line Street. And within this project area is where we will um, potentially be taking on some construction. Uh, now, what type of construction 
might that be? Um, it's worth going over with the group uh, briefly the scope of this project. So this is this is not a capital project with a very large budget in the way that Beacon Street was or in the way that um, Somerville Ave and Union Square was, uh, which is which is just wrapping up now. Uh, so we want to make sure it's clear to everyone that there, while there will be construction um, that potentially taking place, and um, there are, we have some options here. There are some things that are outside of the scope of this project. So walking through sort of the the base, like what is the plan to um, at a very at a bare minimum, what would happen in this project? One would be reconstruction of the sidewalks and all of the curb ramps to make sure that they're fully accessible um, and meeting all the latest um, ADA guidelines uh, and that all the curb ramps are are um, completely up to snuff, excuse me. It would also involve repaving of the street from curve to curb, so no more of that pothole ridden moon uh, surface cratery mess that we have out there right now. So we'd get a fresh new coat of asphalt um, all the way from one curb to the other curb, full, full width of the street from Webster all the way over to line. And then we will also be including new tree planting. So one of the benefits of reconstructing all the sidewalks is that we will um, we can simply ask our contractor and the, the construction project team on this job to leave open pits where we want them for new trees. And so then typically we'll work with our, our arborist and our parks and urban forestry team to pick some trees that make sense for the corridor and then have those, um, have those planted. So there is also a category here for some things that could be included, uh, and that's uh, a, a good chunk of what we want to hear from you all on today is what are the things that are the high, highest priority here, because we can't fit everything we want on Washington Street, unfortunately, um, both in terms of space and um, in, in some cases in terms of budget as well. However, um, we want to run through what all of those items are so that we can start to get at the heart of what are the top priorities here. Uh, one such thing uh, is bus lanes and or changes to bus stops, whether that's the location of the bus stop or the width of the bus stop, any amenities there. Um, bike lanes, um, I, you know, the exact type of treatment would still have to be determined, uh, but bike lanes in some capacity are definitely on the table. Uh, landscaping zones to some degree, plantings um, and grass strips, for example, would fall into that category. Uh, traffic calming, we're currently wrapping up a design process over on Pearl Street, uh, where we're proposing a number of speed humps, a couple of raised intersections uh, or raised crosswalks as well uh, to slow down through traffic and make sure that people are driving at safe speeds in the neighborhood. Um, new and improved crosswalks is another uh, element that could be included in this design. Uh, new meaning an entirely new crosswalk across Washington Street in particular, since we do have existing crosswalks uh, along most of the side streets, um, depending on the, the spacing and a, a design process that we have to go through and what, what some priorities are. Uh, for the neighborhood or improved in the sense that it could potentially have curb extensions so that pedestrians have more waiting space uh, or it could be raised as well. Uh, and so those are all details that would need to be figured out if they are determined to be priorities. Uh, another thing that we're considering starting to include in these types of projects uh, and it's something that we need to, to um, suss out a little bit more on our end is audible push buttons at intersections with traffic signals. So in the case of this corridor, um, that would that would fall on Dane Street at Washington. Um, the, we do already have push audible push buttons over at Beacon and over at Webster Ave. Um, so that would involve making sure the push button is audible so that people who are visually impaired uh, can uh, hear that signal and know when it's appropriate to cross. And lastly, uh, changes to the location and or type of on-street parking is on the table here as well. Lastly, just wanna make it clear to everyone what is outside of the scope of the project and cannot be included at this time. And one of the limitations of sort of uh, 
working through this mid-scale uh, construction project uh, process that we have going here for Western Washington. One is substantial utility work. Uh, so if we're talking about sewer upgrades, if we're talking about grounding overhead utility lines, that will not be involved in this uh, project. These really started as maintenance projects to um, redo the sidewalks and repave the street and we've started to include more and more um, transportation elements to them but uh, utility work does remain outside of the budget that includes changes to street lighting as well so we will not be upgrading or adding any street lights along the corridor here uh, green stormwater infrastructure is another aspect uh, of of that or another piece that is outside of the scope things like bioswales rain gardens, silva cells for anyone that's familiar with those. They're, um, they're really great treatments and we've done a lot of cool stuff in that respect uh, on Somerville Ave. Uh, so for anyone that's in the neighborhood, which I'm sure a lot of you are, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the work going on over there, but that is outside the scope of this particular project. And then lastly, changes to traffic signal control and upgrading the equipment at our traffic signals outside of the push buttons that I just mentioned, of course, um, or network redesign and completely rethinking how traffic flows through the neighborhood uh, on West Wash or on any other side street. So there will not be any um, taking a, a two-way street or, and one-waying it as part of this project uh, because of the amount of time and um, additional funding that that would require. Also just wanna talk briefly about the timeline so everyone can have a, um, a fair expectation of that. So here we are, March 1st, we are starting the community feedback process uh, to, determine, to determine our conceptual design direction. So this, uh, this meeting is one step of this that process. It is the kickoff as well. Um, however, we will be going out. We'll be having individual meetings with as many stakeholders uh, as are interested in the process, whether that is our uh, official advisory committees like the bike committee, our pedestrian transit committee, our disability commission, or whether that's some of the um, people that are going to be uh, that have a, a vested interest in what happens on Western Washington Street, um, such as the uh, Argenziano School and the leadership over there, some of our small business owners, um, any, and really anyone who, who lives on the corridor in, in, is affected. Uh, we'd really like to make sure we're hearing from folks over the course of the next few weeks and, and start to hone in on a design direction. So through April and all the way into May, we will be beginning to develop a uh, concept based on all the feedback that we hear from everyone over the next few weeks. And then we will be coming back to the community to present that concept. Uh, right now, our target is late May um, to have a second community meeting and collecting uh, a second round of feedback from all of you uh, on that conceptual design proposal and continuing to work towards a preferred solution. So once we get all that feedback and have heard what we did, uh, you know, what we got right in the design and what we didn't, we'll be able to uh, work out the final design um, and make sure that that is completed um, over the course of the summer and in time to be included in our bid package. So uh, what we decide on Western Washington plus a handful of other projects that are currently in the works will go into this construction bid package that has all the information a construction contractor will need to uh, be able to put together an estimate and commit to doing this work for us. Uh, that project will be going on alongside of the design for a portion uh, of the summer, as you can see here. And then the idea is that we'll have that design um, fully completed and ready to hand to the contractor uh, as they're being selected. Um, and then we uh, will not be getting started uh, right after that in December uh, over the winter, but first thing in the spring of 2023 is when that construction window is anticipated to start. Like I mentioned, uh, there are a, a handful of other projects that are going to be included in this construction package. It's, it's not just Western Washington. Um, so it may not be the beginning of 2023 that we get started in construction. However, we will be wrapping up construction at the latest uh, at the end of 2024. So there is a, a two year window in which construction could be happening and uh, you know roughly speaking about one year of that will be on western washington but it's hard to know at this time exactly when it will fall within that window 
So now that everyone's clear on the scope of the project um, that we will be planning to undertake here and the timeline on which uh, we would need that to move forward uh, if we want to get construction going in the next couple of years. Uh, we'll take a bit of a step back. Councillor Scott did a great job of sort of talking through some of these um, milestones. I may have gotten this one wrong here. Uh, I think it may have been 2018 actually that these meet neighborhood meetings started but that aside uh, the councilor did have sort of this grassroots effort to talk about the future of Western Washington Street and that resulted in um, a, a street design concept that we then ran with and worked with the MBTA to implement um, really putting an emphasis on bike safety and improvements for bus riders uh, particularly at the time being in the in the throes of the pandemic it was really important for us to make sure that people riding the 86, uh, which is the highest ridership route in Somerville, the most that, you know, it's the busiest bus route in Somerville, making sure that all our essential workers and others, um, you know, we could do everything that we were doing everything we could to, um, to improve their experience. And so uh, we had a community meeting in October. I have a link there uh, to those slides for anyone that is uh, not familiar with them. Um, and then we went forward and implemented the pilot from Dane Street to Webster Ave. And that has been in place for a little over a year now. So we're in that pilot evaluation period. We've been collecting some data, uh, which I won't bore everyone with tonight, but we will be posting um, as we start to post materials about the meeting in the next week if people are interested. Um, but in as we're talking, you know, working on that evaluation period and letting people experience this and also doing our own sort of evaluation, um, we had the, the benefit of Western Washington being identified as a priority for repa repaving. And so that that's sort of what gets us here today is that um, this project was, uh, I think, and a lot of people would be happy to hear this, uh, identified as the street that is going to be next paved in Somerville and the sidewalks will be reconstructed. Again, I'm, I'm fairly certain that everyone on the call tonight is aware of the pilot. However, if there's anyone that isn't, uh, just have a quick snapshot here of what uh, the cross section and what the street looked like prior to the pilot. And then here's a photo from right after it was implemented. This is at Dane Street, uh, Perry Park looking east towards Union Square in the Argenziano School, uh, where you can see we had parking on both sides previously um, and to travel, a travel lane in each direction. And uh, currently, at least along this stretch, uh, there is a combined bus and right turn lane, uh, still to a travel lane in each direction, um, and then a bike lane along the right side, the south side of the corridor. There were a few things that we were trying to accomplish as part of this pilot, uh, and I'll just run through those quickly for the group. Um, for anyone that was at the meeting, I think it was clear that our, our primary goal above all else was to really improve service for riders of the 86 bus. Um, you know, that is an important city goal, both uh, in a number of long range plans, but in particular when this project was rolled out, um, because of the number of essential workers that were being affected and that still relied on the 86 bus. Um, so in the context of making making things as um, making improvements for them as quickly as possible, that was that was definitely uh, number one priority for us. Another really important piece was making sure that we were enhancing the safety and comfort for people biking on Washington Street as well. Uh, it's a pretty important bike route and runs between two of the uh, most highly biked routes in the region, uh, whether that's over on Beacon Street or on Somerville Ave. So there's definitely demand and a lot of people that bike here as well. And we want to make sure that Western Washington Street is as safe for them as possible. Uh, thirdly, we want to improve the visibility of mid-block crosswalks across Washington Street. So in particular, we had heard concerns about the crosswalk at Hawkins Street, down closer to Webster Ave and the Argenziano, as well as the crosswalk at Perry Park. So doing what we could to make sure that, that cross, those crosswalks were more visible uh, was a priority for us. Um, fourth on the list here was reducing speeding behavior by narrowing travel lanes. So while we didn't have a lot of opportunity to use more aggressive traffic calming measures, uh, we were, it was one of our goals to do what we could to make sure that people were driving at a safer speed here. 
And then lastly, knowing that the, the primary trade-off of being able to improve bus surface and enhance safety uh, for cyclists in particular was that we were going to uh, lose some on-street parking and the amount of on-street parking available would be reduced. Uh, we wanted to minimize the impacts and continue to study that and do what we could to change regulations uh, in a way that took better advantage of the space that we, we do continue to have. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kate briefly, and we're going to get some feedback from everyone on the pilot. Thanks everyone. Thanks for bearing with me. It's very unmuted. Um, so I just shared a link in a chat. We are going to be doing a Mentimeter this evening. So you can either use the link directly in your chat or you can go to menti.com and type in the ID number 92890439. We've got two questions for you today. What works well today on the pilot and what opportunities for improvement do you observe today? I'm going to share my screen and we're going to see some of these come in. Okay, great. So as they come in, I'll start to share them out. So some things that are coming in that says it works well today, we've got bus lane, bike lanes, limited parking, some separation, walking, see slower traffic. I see a couple different things relating to bike. So you all kind of see them pop up too. So to kind of pull together some of the bike ones, um, we've got the specific lanes, the buffered bike lane, protected bikes, um, got some, some people calling out the traffic calming, saying it feels safer and slower, say visible crossing at Perry and enhanced crosswalks. I'll just give you folks a few more minutes. It looks like we've got 36 people participating. Um, but I think right now what I'm seeing the most highlighted are traffic calming, bike lanes, bus lane, and walking. And again, this will, this recording will be available on the project website directly after, or probably within the next day or two in the meeting. And again, we'll have these displayed as well. So awesome, thanks so much for pulling it out. I'm gonna say one I loved I just saw was biking a market basket. Um, but again, just kind of what we're hearing, traffic calming, bus lanes, bike lanes, um, and walking. Okay, wonderful. So if you want to go to your next question, and you can share some of the opportunities for improvement that you observed today. I'll give you a minute. Okay, some opportunities are to protect all parts of the bike lane, add an additional crosswalk at Jane improve bike safety at Washington and Beacon. Bottom of bridge allows blocking bike lane. We need more parking spaces. Bike lanes are too narrow. Better parking management, slowing traffic, parking distance from intersections. Another mention of Dane, dangerous between Dane and Beacon. More planted tree trenches with vegetation. Um, kind of conflicts around school pick up and drop off where um, people might be parking in the bike lane in front of the Argentiano. Um, so many potholes, so many bumps and potholes. Um, complete separation of bike lane, safety for pedestrians, um, charge market rate for parking, another mention of Dane with raised crosswalk at Dane, intersection with push buttons and striped crosswalks. Um, so we've got quite a couple comments in. Maybe I'll do about three or four more, and then I'll take us back so we can get into the next round. Um, but more ways to cut to Somerville Ave. Um, not enough parking spaces, no trees. We need a curb ramp, curb ramp at Perry Street. Um, better signage at Crosswalk at Hawkins. Um, bike lanes between Dane and Beacon. Easy access for handicap or wheelchair on the pedestrian walkway. Um, Another mention of potholes. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for sharing your comments. Um, and I will take us back to Adam who will get us into more of the presentation. Adam. 
Adam, do you want to take back the share screen? Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Got it. Sorry about that. Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. Okay. Appreciate everyone's participation there. Hopefully that breaks up the presentation a little bit for everyone. Um, and so while the goal of tonight is definitely to get uh, everyone's feedback and input on how the pilot has gone and the future of Washington Street, uh, we did figure we'd, you know, we've been collecting some data um, and have spent some time um, trying to understand the impact of the pilot ourselves and figured we'd at least have a, a summary slide for anyone that's interested here. So um, with each of the goals that I had just identified prior to our brief poll, uh, I just have a quick um, snapshot here of how the pilot has impacted that based on our understanding and some of the data we've collected and just an important consideration to keep in mind. So uh, as I had explained, one of our primary goals was to improve service for riders of the 86 bus as a, a key bus route in Somerville. Uh, and what we found that there was actually an improvement, um, particularly in eastbound travel times, uh, even compared to 2019 when traffic was higher. So, um, you know, that should probably doesn't come as a surprise based on what we were seeing in the word cloud there from folks, but the longer bus lane heading into Webster Ave um, based on, I think, both anecdote and then based on what we've seen through the data indicates uh, that those travel times have improved over the course of the day uh, for buses, which is great. And just something to keep in mind is that Route 86 does continue to be Somerville's busiest route, and it's actually maintained a higher percentage of percentage of ridership uh, than almost every other route in Somerville during the course of the pandemic, indicating to us that there is a large percentage of people who rely on that bus to get where they need to go. And so it continues to be a priority for us going forward. And um, we want to make that, that clear to folks um, and hope everyone would agree. Our second goal here of improving safety and comfort for people biking. Um, while people, while we did find that more people were biking in general uh, part, uh, over the course of the day, particularly in the evening hours, though, uh, it's a little bit less concentrated in the morning commute now, uh, spread over the course of the day and in general is higher in the PM. It's difficult for us to say that that's uh, due to the pilot that we implemented for one, because uh, you don't tend to see those changes that quickly. It's one of the difficult things of trying to measure the impact of our projects is that changing people's behavior often takes um, more time than we'd like. It's not something that happens over the course of a few months or a year or even two years. It can sometimes take um, longer to see that. However, we do start to see those, those trends typically. And we definitely did hear, however, everyone knows uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic and it's it's definitely made that whole effort to understand how this pilot um, has impacted um, travel behavior on Western Washington Street and how people use the street. Um, it, it's, it's made it a challenge for sure. So uh, we don't wanna necessarily attribute that to the pilot, uh, but we did notice that is a trend. An, an important consideration in that regard is that blue bikes, uh, for anyone that's not aware, that's our, our regional bike share system and those those blue bikes at stations that you see scattered around the city had its best year yet in 2021. So we saw the highest ridership we've, we've seen in any year that blue bikes has existed in 2021, um, meaning that more people are biking in general and in particular, a lot of recreational users. So people who are going out on a Saturday or a Sunday and, and taking um, a casual ride probably not to work but to for for some other trips that they're um that they're using to get around they're choosing bike um it's also important to keep in mind that bike ridership tends to increase more when you have continuous facilities uh as we saw in the comments of what we could improve we uh didn't we did not extend the protected bike lanes all the way over from Dane to Beacon. Uh, so there continues to be a gap and we would expect that bike ridership uh, would increase more if we had gone all the way um, to Beacon Street there. Uh, another goal, improving the visibility of those mid-block crosswalks that I discussed briefly. Um, similar to bikes, we are seeing uh, more people walking, which is great, uh, particularly in the evening hours. Again, However, it's difficult to understand what of that to how to cancel out that noise of what could be due to the pandemic. Um, 
and something to keep in mind is that while we were really limited to, to using paint and signs as part of this project, we will have an opportunity to uh, make more substantial improvements to safety at crosswalks with this upcoming project. Um, fourth goal here, reducing speeding behavior. Um, one of the disappointing things that we did find uh, as we were uh, measuring the impacts of the pilot was that we did actually see an, uh, a slight increase in the in vehicle speeds compared to the before condition. Um, it's not necessarily surprising to us because we did notice, uh, or there has been a, a, a national trend, a statewide trend, even a local trend based on data we've collected in Somerville, more people are speeding uh, and have been speeding over the course of the pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of research going on to figure out what has contributed to that. Clearly some of it is a, a less congestion, um, but are, are people just more impatient behind the wheel? I think those kinds of questions are, are still being answered. Um, and so we don't know for sure, but uh, we do want to acknowledge that we, we did see a, a slight increase in speeding. Um, however, it, it's important to keep in mind that now that we have a, another bite at the apple and a more substantial project uh, budget, we can potentially provide opportunities for more effective traffic calming with the implementation of things like bump outs or speed humps or, or raised crosswalks. And lastly here, minimizing the impact of reduced on-street parking. Uh, we have continued to collect counts since the pilot began. And while we, uh, more or less what we found was that the same number of cars are parking in the neighborhood at various times of day. However, since there is slightly less available parking spaces in the neighborhood as a whole, um, that, that the percentage of spaces that's used is higher. However, um, it continues to be well below capacity uh, during the, all the times that we've measured it, whether that's um, during the AM commute, whether that's um, at lunchtime in the evening or, or even late at night when we know demand typically tends to be the highest and the most people are trying to find a spot uh, as they park their car overnight. Uh, and so lastly, just a reminder that we can uh, have it, we do have an opportunity again to rethink where parking continues to be located on the Western Washington Street corridor, as well as what those regulations are and whether or not we can use the existing space more effectively. So uh, we won't go into any more detail about the, uh, the data that we have, but the details of these analyses here and some additional existing conditions data that we typically collect as part of the, the first phase of these projects uh, will be posted on the project webpage for anyone that is interested and like to dig in more. Lastly here, um, before we move off the pilot and get into street design options for everyone today, uh, just a couple of higher level things that I wanted to make sure um, everyone was aware of to, to sort of frame folks thinking uh, about the pilot and about what we can do on Western Washington Street going forward. Um, one thing to keep in mind in particular is that the Argenziano School was completely remote when the pilot was first implemented. However, students are now back to in-person learning, so some things that maybe seemingly um, we're working okay at first, suddenly there was a whole new demand. Uh, suddenly we have uh, parents biking their kids to school. There's a lot more people using the crosswalk at the Argenziano and nearby. Uh, there's a lot more parents uh, dropping off. And so there's just a lot more demand at particular times of day and particularly around the Argenziano that we wanna keep in mind for this phase of the process. Um, secondly, uh, the pilot was never intended to be an end all be all for Western Washington Street, like Councillor Scott said, um, it was a test. And for us, it was also a unique opportunity to quickly deliver changes um, and better travel accommodations during the pandemic for essential workers and other people who rely on the bus. Um, so doing that on such a short timeline meant that we had to use low cost materials. And now we now have the opportunity to improve upon what we've already done um, with more substantial changes, with different materials, with things that can work better uh, as part of this project. And then lastly, there um, does continue to be uncertainty about how the pandemic will affect long-term travel plans. And so while we need to accommodate today's demands for sure, we see this as a unique opportunity to um, to actually build a street that reflects our future wants for Washington Street, for Western Washington Street, not simply to uh, try and fit it into where we see things going, but to actually change that direction um, and to, 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 do, to build the, the street that we want in the future. <coughs> oh, 
apologies. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna run through some options for everyone that, uh, that we could potentially see for Washington Street. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just gonna pause for a water break really quickly. While Adam takes a break, I just want to remind folks that you can continue to input your questions in the chat. Just a reminder that we'll read them out loud when we get to the Q&A so that we can make sure that it can be heard in English and Portuguese. Again, feel free to send them in the chat and we'll read them out at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Kate. All right, so let's get into it. Um, before we put some options up on the screen. I do just uh, want to put this slide up on the uh, up for everyone uh, that we do include in almost all of our projects, which is um, just a reminder that we do have a number of long, long range plans that are intended to reflect the community's vision for Somerville going forward that we rely pretty, pretty heavily on um, when we're thinking about street design and, and what's best for any given street in Somerville. Whether that's our commitment to vision zero, um, meaning reducing traffic fatalities and serious injuries to zero in Somerville, uh, or that's our climate forward plan and reducing our carbon emissions, uh, whether it's the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan and making sure that we're upgrading our streets uh, and infrastructure to better, better serve um, persons with disabilities, or Summer Vision 2040, which in a lot of ways encompasses all of those plans and is Somerville's sort of long range comprehensive plan with uh, our overarching goals for the, the kind of city we want to be. So um, in addition to the community input that we're hearing from all of you, these plans do play a role in the street design projects um, that we implement. So with that, um, this, he, this is an example of the cross section of Washington Street from property line to property line. Now I will uh, add the caveat that it does, the corridor does widen out a little bit um, as you get closer to Webster Ave. However, the majority of the street that we're gonna be talking about uh, falls into this 60 foot width here. So from the edge of uh, one property line all the way to the other side of the street. That's a lot of room uh, and there's a lot that we can do with that 60 feet. However, um, is there anything that's sort of non-negotiable right now? And uh, the answer is yes. So we will not be narrowing or removing sidewalks on either side of the street as part of this effort. Um, pedestrians are our number one priority in Somerville and we will not be removing, um, removing or even narrowing uh, sidewalks as part of this project and, and it would be very unlikely to do so as part of any future effort. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that even if we were to narrow um, the sidewalks by a foot or two, uh, that would likely require removing all of the trees along that section of corridor as well. And that is, that is also something uh, that we would, uh, we will not be including as part of this project. We will also be maintaining a travel lane in each direction as part of this project. So uh, converting Washington Street to a one way would require a lot of analysis. It would require community process. It would require re redesigning uh, the entire network in that neighborhood. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, it would fundamentally alter the route uh, of the 86 bus, which in theory is something that could happen. However, that would be a long process uh, that would require uh, its own funding source and taking on the logistics of such a change is outside of the scope of this project, uh, particularly given that we're in order to be able to begin construction sometime in 2023 or early 2024, um, we, we need to have design wrapped up in the next few months. So we will be maintaining a travel lane in each direction as part of this effort. So. That leaves us with 19 feet of space to work with. And in this image diagram here, it's shown as two nine and a half foot buffers. So the question really that we wanna to pose to everyone and just give folks some options to start mulling over is what could we do with that extra space and what could we prioritize? So first off um, and the sort of formatting style that I've chosen here uh, is to highlight 
the uh, any given prioritization of the five that are shown here. Not to say that this is everything we could possibly consider, but that um, you know, 95% of, of what we typically consider as part of a street design uh, roughly falls into one of these five categories. So if we were to prioritize on-street parking uh, as our number one priority on the street, uh, it would look something like this. So you would have two eight-foot parking lanes, uh, and you really don't have, uh, if we were to just go all out on parking, you could provide two parking lanes, one eight-foot parking lane on either side, and then two 12 foot travel lanes. And uh, this is actually the existing condition uh, on Washington Street currently between Dane and Beacon um, and was the existing condition on much of Western Washington Street prior to the beginning of the pilot. As you move east on the corridor, um, this option right here actually reflects uh, the current pilot condition on Washington uh, from Dane Street to approximately Perry Park. I showed a, a photo of that earlier. So what this option here does is it puts, uh, it really prioritizes bus mobility, gives buses a dedicated bus lane here that bikes uh, heading in that direction, heading westbound, have to share with buses, uh, and then has a secondary priority of bikes. So it does give bikes their, um, their own dedicated space heading in the opposite direction towards our Genziano. Another option here, one that's fairly similar to the existing condition on uh, sort of the middle chunk of Western Washington currently in the pilot condition, about from Ferry Park to Argenziano, um, is a, an option that prioritizes bike mobility. So you have fully separated bike lanes in both directions. And of these five, the secondary priority uh, that you're able to fit in here is on street parking. So uh, you're not able to prioritize it to the degree of having a parking lane in both directions, but you can fit in, in addition to the bike lanes on either side, you can fit in one parking lane on one side of the street. Another option similar to that one, uh, and one of the reasons I'm showing that here is because you, as you can see, you can actually just uh, sort of swap out the parked car here um, for what we call a floating bus stop if you want to continue to uh, prioritize bike mobility, but also uh, then have bus mobility and a wider landscaping zone as your secondary priorities. Uh, you can actually fit those bike lanes and you can, at a bus stop, for example, uh, swap out that parking for a, a large uh, waiting area for bus riders. You could put a bench in there. You could potentially even put some plantings um, and you could have, have this condition where um, it separates. What this does is it separates bike movements from bus movements so that buses aren't stopping in the bike lane along the curb to pick up passengers, but actually pushes that out so that there's more space for people to wait. Uh, the bus can simply stop right in the travel lane to pick up uh, passengers. And then um, this does prioritize buses because it uh, doesn't require them to have to pull back into a lane of cars. They, uh, they simply have to continue to move along and then uh, prevents that conflict between bikes and buses. I'll throw out another couple of options for people to consider and what things might look like if we prioritize things a little uh, di bit differently. So if we were to prioritize on-street parking as our number one priority, uh, maintain a travel lane in each direction, what would it look like if we tried to um, then have bike mobility as our second pri secondary priority. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't really do a whole lot for bikes. You can fit one um, sort of standard or basic bike lane, as we call it, in one direction. However, these it, it's not totally clear how much of an improvement uh, from a safety perspective that is for cyclists. We, we definitely prefer protected bike lanes where possible because there is a, a hazard for dooring, meaning that someone could open their, their car door after parking um, and, and hit someone on a bike and seriously injure them. So uh, that's an example of if we tried to prioritize on-street parking as our top priority, and if bikes, uh, bike mobility was our secondary priority, what this could look like. Um, and so, so that, you know, the, the idea here is that not everything, you know, not everything here is um, 
completely compatible with each other. Uh, just a couple more options. If we were to go all in on bus mobility, what would that look like? So we don't have, uh, we don't actually have enough width to provide a bus lane in either direction, which would sort of be the preferred option if we really wanted to focus solely on, on moving buses through the corridor as quickly as possible. However, what we could do is we could put a bus lane in one direction uh, that bikes could share with that bus. And in the other direction, you could have a uh, another one of those floating bus stops that I had described. So you would you could extend the sidewalk. Uh, people could continue to move up and down the corridor on the standard sidewalk here, but they could wait for the bus here, and then buses would stop at the bus stop and um, and pick up passengers right from the travel lane. If we were to go all in on wider landscaping zones, which we haven't really talked about much. Um, that could look uh, basically taking out those buffers that I'd shown at the very beginning of the presentation and swapping it out for some kind of planting strip, for example. Um, I do want to note that while this is um, an option and, you know, maybe if we this wasn't the type of project uh, where we had some constraints in a smaller budget, we could consider something like this for the full length of the corridor. Um, we, we don't want to constrain people's thinking and we want to understand what the priorities are, uh, but something like this would only be possible in very uh, short stretches, particularly because the amount of drainage rework that would be required in moving all of the catch basins along the corridor to move the curbs in and to be able to accommodate those planting strips. So it is something that could happen in very short stretches at particular locations, um, but is unlikely to be uh, an option that we could realistically pursue for the length of the corridor within the scope of this project. And the same thing goes for this last option here. So if we were to um, prioritize wider sidewalks and making all the sidewalks double wide within the corridor, this is an example of what that could look like and could potentially make sense at certain locations and in very short stretches and might be able, might be something that we could potentially accommodate. However, again, for the length of the corridor, uh, that would likely have to be part of a different project uh, with more budget and on a longer timeline. So with that, I will wrap up this section of the presentation um, by just reminding everyone that we uh, will be um, taking all of the input that we hear from everyone and again, making sure that we're comparing that to our long range planning um, guidance to make sure that it is consistent with uh, everything that we uh, want, to, want to be and we want our streets to be in Somerville in the long term. So with that, we will move into our feedback collection portion. Thanks, Adam. So we're gonna just start with some initial feedback Zoom polls as you're starting to think through some of your questions in the chat or getting ready for spoken comment. We have two more for you this evening. The first is, you know, as Adam's discussed, is we're planning to reconstruct sidewalks and repave Washington Street between Webster Ave and Line Street. Are you interested in the city pursuing this effort with the understanding that some elements such as burying utility lines or moving the curve for the length of the corridor are outside of the project scope? The second is what would you like to see more of on Western Washington Street? So I'll launch those polls now and give you a moment um, to take them. Do you see the window pop up on your screen? And again, I'll just give you a moment to take them and then read out the result results. And again, if you wanna prepare any of your chat questions, feel free to send them in. And after some of our chat questions, we'll make space for spoken comment. Okay, so I have some people taking some of the questions. Um, there should be, again, if you can't see the window, it should be popped up right in the middle of your Zoom screen. And again, those two questions that we talked about listed on, or shared on the presentation slide. Okay, it looks like we've got about 33 people completing them. I'll give you all just a minute more um, and then share out the results.
Okay, it looks like we got about 39 people participating. I'll give you about um, 30 more seconds. And again, this is just an optional just pull. Just want to give you all some space to think through some of your questions. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for participating. I'm going to share that out. So you should see on your screen the shared results. So about 41 people participating in the first one. Um, and Adam, if you want to keep those questions displayed, let me make sure that people get the background info. Um, so we had about 83% 83 pe of people say that they are interested in having the sidewalks fixed and moving forward with a limited scope. And again, this is just to get some initial feedback, just trying to learn what people think. Um, and about 17% said they'd rather wait until a time when there is a bigger um, project. Then moving into some of the things that people are most looking forward to on Western Washington is we had about 59% of people said they're interested in more trees and greenery, 15% said long-term vehicle parking, 15% um, said short-term vehicle parking, so this is your 15, 30, 60 minutes, and long-term is your two hours plus. 68 of percent of people said crosswalks, new and improved. 29% of people said wider sidewalks. 51% of people said bus stop amenities. And 73% of people said protected bicycle lanes. Again, this is just a little temp check to see where some people's initial feedback is. But I'm going to pivot to some um, chat questions um, and then shortly move into spoken comment. Okay, great. So I'm going to start us off with some, Just bear with me folks. Okay, wonderful. So let's see, our first one is um, us, let's see, we'll do a pedestrian question first. Um, someone shared that um, it's quite dangerous for people walking in front of the, where the dry ice company owned by Saveners is. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about anything to improve safety with turning traffic and trucks and loaded parking on Washington Street? Yeah, sure. So that is going to be um, one that we're definitely going to have to take a little bit more of an in-depth look at. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's a common condition in Somerville. Uh, it's definitely a unique land use. So I think we can start by upgrading the sidewalks and making sure that those are compliant, but we will need to do a little bit more uh, work to figure out what else we can do to make sure that um, those trucks, uh, one, are paying attention to pedestrians, but two, are also not parking where they shouldn't be. So there's an enforcement piece here, but there are things that we can look at from a design side um, to make sure that uh, it, it's not, um, to make sure that we're, we can accomplish uh, safety for people walking in particular on this corridor. So I don't have a good answer as to exactly what we would do for that yet, um, but it's, it's I appreciate the, the flag and it's something that we can keep in mind as we start our design effort. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so next I have a bus and transit question. Um, so question out of general curiosity, given um, we can only do one bus lane, how do we pick which direction to give bus priority? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. So um, what we did for the pilot was to look at bus delay in both directions. So we have the benefit of having uh, regular data and, and pretty fine grain data that comes in from the MBTA. Um, for anyone that takes the bus and uses an app like Transit, for example, uh, you'll know that there's a GPS tracker on these buses that, that tracks that location, um, mostly in live time um, or very close. And they can use that data to then see how long it takes buses to get along certain segments of a given street. Um, and so what we did and what we would do as part of this project as well, what we did for the pilot and what we do part of this for this project as well is to look at the delay in both directions and where it's concentrated 
and figure out which direction um, makes the most sense. So that's how we ended up choosing approaching Dane, heading towards Beacon Street um, at, at that end of the, the pilot project area and then into to Webster Ave in Union Square uh, on the other side of the pilot. So um, Beacon is definitely a little, a little bit trickier and it's a little bit more balanced. So we'd also have to take that and weigh it against our other priorities and see if some of those design decisions change what we might do in terms of the where the bus lane is or if it's a bus lane um, and and how that decision, you know, there are, there are a number of other factors that could influence that decision as well. But at face value, uh, we would look at delay and see which direction buses are having more trouble getting through. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. So before I jump into a few more questions, I know Councillor Scott has also gotten a couple. Councillor Scott, would you like to share some? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the upsides to uh, having your phone number listed on the city website uh, and having regular office hours is everybody knows how to get a hold of me. Um, I just wanted to pass along that uh, some folks who are logging on through their phones uh, haven't been able to answer the poll questions. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, for them, is there going to be another place where they can fill out this poll after the meeting uh, so that their, their answers can come in here? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Scott. So we these questions are also all going to be in the survey that we'll be releasing this week. So anyone that registered for the meeting this evening, you're going to get a follow up email with that survey link and it's available in our five most spoken languages. Um, it'll also be available on the project website. And we'll also be flyering and pull with the flyers having QR codes so you can take them on your phone. Wonderful. That's uh, that's very helpful. And that'll work on phones or iPads. Uh, and if you do have any problems uh, filling that out, again, uh, Kate's email is right here on the screen or phone number is right there. And I, I know you all got mine. Uh, so feel free to reach out and I'll be glad to help you get the survey questions in. Um, the other question I got was um, on the what would you like to see more of on Washington Street, there was no mention of uh, our Genziano uh, pickup drop off or, uh, or management um, and folks are wondering where that was in the question or, or where to provide that feedback. Right, so if it's, uh, if it's on street, that would be in, um, that would be part of the sort of on street parking priorities uh, that would fall into that category. However, it's a, a matter of figuring out uh, parking management uh, in the greater context of Argenziano outside of Washington Street. Um, that is something that we can, I mean, I think we'll be, so we'll be following up with the school to, to figure out, uh, to have a more detailed conversation about that. Um, but I think, well, there's also sort of an open comment section of the survey. So if folks want to talk a little bit more about that in the survey, that's, and we're happy to talk about it here as well. So uh, I think the, the questions were a little bit more geared towards like um, Washington, Western Washington Street priorities itself, but it's a, it's a good thing that we're definitely going to need to keep in mind. It's a good point. All right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll hold on the rest of my thoughts. Uh, thanks for letting me jump in with some for folks who couldn't get in. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Scott. So I'm going to share out another bus transit question. Um, I think this one's for Adam. Adam, could we make part of Washington Street one way for cars, but two way for buses or bikes that would, wouldn't re require any redesign of the 86 bus route? Um, so in theory, yes, uh, as part of this project, no, that is outside of the scope. Um, there is, there approximately, it's, it's hard to know now with the pandemic, I'd have to go back and check the numbers. There are at least 3000 cars a day, uh, that use, you know, pick one of the directions on Washington street. That is a lot of traffic to reroute. Uh, and we wouldn't do that that type of change. Uh, that's a pretty massive change. And I don't know if that's something that we've ever taken uh, taken on in Somerville to date. And if we were to do that, it would require a lot of in-depth analysis. It would require more time. Um, we'd have to do a bunch of data collection and figuring out how that would work. And so in theory, yes, something like that uh, is possible, um, but it would definitely have to be part of a different effort um, and would likely be something that would be taking place uh, 
a few years down the road versus now. Um, if we continue to want to prioritize getting something constructed in the next couple of years, uh, that it, unfortunately one of the constraints is that we will maintain two two way traffic for all vehicles. Thanks, Adam. So next I have a biking question. Um, so uh, could you talk about how have you me measured utilization of the new Washington Street bike lane? Yeah, so um, I'm assuming that means utilization in the context of uh, our people using it. And so what we've done to date, we um, have just done some anecdotal observations. We've gone out um, as a team and, and simply looked at the corridor. I know I've been out at the Argenziano a couple of times during pickup and drop off, just trying to understand uh, some of the issues over there and how people use thing, uh, you know, use the different facilities that we've implemented um, and what could be improved. And then um, we, from a data perspective, what we've been doing is collecting counts. So how we typically do that is we'll either put down a set of rubber tubes on the street or we'll set up um, a, a camera for, you know, uh, 10 to 12 hours uh, on the, during a typical weekday. And then you can go through and you can actually see how many cars are going through versus pedestrians versus bikes uh, and understand what the, um, understand how many people are actually going through on uh, on a given day. And so that has been our sort of key metric for understanding whether or not the bike, uh, whether or not, um, or the number of people utilizing the bike lane. We also collect bike and ped counts every fall at a set number of locations across the city. And uh, a couple of those locations do fall within this project corridor. So, um, so we will, um, so we'll also be looking at that to um, in help inform how bike uh, counts have been utilized or how the bike lanes have been utilized, sorry. Thanks, Adam. So I have a couple planting questions. So these might be for you, Brian. Um, so our first one is, could you talk a little bit if will existing trees be removed? Um, so generally on our street reconstruction projects, we do not, we actually take every effort to not remove the trees. Uh, the only time we would remove a tree, uh, aside from poor health that was already going to be removed, is if it is um, obstructing ADA accessibility and there was no other reasonable alternative to that. Uh, luckily on Washington Street, we do have slightly wider sidewalks than elsewhere in the city. Uh, so we're hopeful that uh, we'll be able to manage any sort of accessibility constraint uh, without removing the existing trees. Thanks, Brian. I have a we have a follow up to that one, if I could ask you that too. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to have street trees placed in the parking lane instead of taking sidewalk space for trees? So going back to the not removing existing trees, I, I, we wouldn't replant trees in the parking lane to avoid to and then also remove trees from the sidewalk. However, as far as adding new trees, that's something that we could consider. However, we would not plant trees on top of existing or proposed utility lines. And so if there were utility lines underneath that parking lane, uh, we would not be able to do that. So it's really a case by case uh, condition. Uh, we can plant uh, a lower uh, vegetation and plantings over utilities, but trees are, um, are, are not something that we try to, to do. We try to avoid that. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so I have a couple of walking questions. Um, our first one is, is there any plan to improve the walking experience for handicapped or senior residents who live along Washington Street to or from Lincoln Park and the shops along the street? Yeah, so I guess um, not being totally 
sure on what uh, I think walking experience could accompany a few different things. Um, but the most basic element of this project is the reconstruction of sidewalks so that they are as flat as possible. There are no big lips or anything uh, in that there are curb ramps as well that are as flat as possible um, and that it's really just a much smoother experience. Um, and we have completely, completely new sidewalks in that regard. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, I would, I would like to say uh, yes, the plan is to improve uh, the walking experience for everyone, but uh, I think in particular uh, that could be beneficial to handicap and senior residents uh, and does in, encompass that um, the, the Lincoln Park to sort of, uh, you know, shops on either end, whether it's in Union Square or in the Beacon Street. And, um, and then there is also some opportunity to improve uh, amenities within there as well. Um, if we were to consider something like uh, bike lanes, for example, that does uh, further increase the distance from moving traffic. So that is kind of a passive benefit of the walking experience. But you also have more opportunity to put things in the furnishing zone, sort of that, that distance from the curb uh, to where people typically walk that I was, it, it had a tree in it in those present, uh, in the presentation slides that I was showing. So just adding more trees to create more of a barrier, uh, maybe adding a, a bike rack um, or something else that could fit well in that space is certainly opportunity as well and would make that a more comfortable walking experience. So hopefully that starts to answer some of that question. Thanks, Adam. And just another um, walking question. Are there design choices that would make it easier to use sidewalk plows or other equipment to clear snow slash ice from sidewalks in the winter? I think Typically speaking, the uh, Brian, you can chime in here too as well. But I think uh, I think providing adequate space to be able to get that equipment through is kind of a basic um, basic piece of that equation, and something that we definitely take into account as we're installing new bike facilities. So the same kind of logic uh, could apply to sidewalks and ensuring that there actually is adequate width for that that equipment to to get through there. But I'll also, I'll defer to Brian here. Yeah, I, I, uh, just briefly on that. Um, first off, it's a fantastic idea. Um, and we haven't really uh, worked with DPW to see if there is a reasonable solution in that idea. Um, it has bounced around a couple times before. We do know that the, the, the critical issue is the width of the clear path of the sidewalk. So making sure that there are absolutely no uh, obstructions in that clear width, uh, and then figuring out what that clear width would be for whatever equipment we have, whether it would be four, five, or six feet wide, uh, it would have to be coordinated with DPW. That is something that we're considering, but that's a very long way off. So I got one more. Um pedestrian question for you all, and then we'll do a couple of utilities, and then I'd love to move to spoken comment. If we haven't gone to all your chat questions, we'll try and um, do so at the end, but if not, we'll make sure, please reach out to us at any point to ask your questions. Um, so then next, we got a couple regarding raised crosswalks. Are raised crosswalks being considered, and would they be considered for the intersections at Dane and, um, sure, excuse me, bear with me, Dane and Calvin Street? So that's the kind of thing that that we're we're trying to figure out as part of this project because uh, we have a more limited budget and scope than sort of a typical capital project. Um, since this 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 isn't that type of project, uh, there is raised crosswalks are something we can consider. However, it would likely be in very limited numbers um, because of the drainage rework that is typically associated with that and the um, the sort of subsurface work that would have to happen that really starts to eat into our budget uh, a lot. And we want to make sure that we're doing as much for the full length of the corridor, not focusing too much uh, on any given one location. So it's definitely a, a balance and we don't 
we don't know exactly where those will be yet. And that's part of what we want to hear from you all on is what are the priorities if we if we could do something like that at one or two locations. I will say it's highly unlikely that we would do it along the length of the, the corridor uh, along side streets, for example. Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just a, a little bit of nuance to that. Um, there are times when raising the the side street crosswalks actually improves drainage. And there are other times when it makes drainage much more expensive and costly to manage. So it it really it really depends on the location, the local drainage considerations in that intersection. Um, but it is it's definitely something that we could consider. That actually segues nicely into this next question. Brian, I think this one's for you. Um, what can we do to make sure this work does not interfere with future stormwater slash flood mitigation efforts in the area? So the uh, that's a that's a that's a good question because um, we the engineering division is also going through a stormwater and flooding mitigation and planning project right now. And we do know that we will have projects in Ward 2 and in particular uh, along Western Washington at some location. Uh, the exact location, the exact extent to it um, uh, is not entirely known, but of the options that we have, we do know that that would be an isolated impact to West Washington, uh, maybe a block at most. So the, our current feeling right now is that it is better to proceed with the reconstruction of West Washington and suffer a little bit of reconstruction down the road to deal with, uh, to execute the flooding storage, the flooding solutions, rather than to delay the project to after those uh, flooding solutions can be designed and implemented. And Brian, could you share a little bit about how much the repaving process costs and how long it takes to do it now versus wait for a bigger project like burying, burying the utility lines? Yeah, so, and, and this is really off the cuff, but relative to other similar projects, um, Western Washington repaving it, redoing the sidewalks, et cetera, um, is, is in the one to $2 million range um, of construction. And so it's, it's a pretty substantive uh, investment. Uh, once we do it, we're not gonna wanna come back and do large utility work, which is a lot of the reason why we did, um, we scheduled this work after we did water reconstruction a few years ago, after we coordinated with Eversource Gas to do their gas work last summer um, so that we could get a lot of the utility work um, out of the way in the ground and not be a potential surprise after we get into doing the street reconstruction. So it, it would be really, really challenging um, to put to ground the utility poles after we did the street reconstruction project. Um, and that would be a substantive design effort to do um, uh, utility grounding. Uh, I, I don't know how possible or impossible that is uh, that has been some conversations with Eversource in the generic, um, not specifically discussing West Washington. Thanks, Brian. Um, so everyone joining us, I'd love to make sure we have some time for spoken comment. I might read one more question out, but if you could start to raise your hands. Um, and Adam, if you go to the next slide so that folks know just in case how to find the raise hand function, I can then make sure we can get you all ready in the queue. So one more question before you all, before we jump into spoken comment is, Adam, I know you talked a little bit already around school pickup and drop off, but has the product team observed traffic and impact of the lack of parking around the area during the morning drop off and dismissal um, at the Argenziano? Yeah, so this is something that we've definitely heard is a concern. Um, I've witnessed myself after understanding that these issues exist. Um, sorry, Kate, are you muted? I can hear myself. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, folks, just having a hard time thinking there. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, 
we have heard that there are um, issues. I've seen it myself, uh, and I think that's something that we're going to have to put a lot of thought into uh, at this next phase of the design with this upcoming project is uh, how things operate at the Argenziano, um, because there is just a limited amount of space, uh, as we went through in the presentation, and we have to try to figure out how to accommodate a bunch of different needs, uh, and so I think part of that will happen on Western Washington, um, but the, the benefit of uh, having the Argenziano right there is also that there, there are some, um, you know, we can potentially use space off of Western Washington to start to accommodate some of those challenges and, and solve some of those issues. So I think that's going to be, um, because there's such a unique demand at certain times of day, that's going to be something that we, our team definitely have to spend more time on and uh, talk with the school leadership team on. Thanks, Adam. So we're going to move into spoken comment. Folks, if we didn't get to your question, we're going to try and get some at the end. But again, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Adam on the project team. Um, just a reminder to speak out loud during the discussion, please select the raise hand function. You can find this by clicking on the reactions button in your toolbar and our window will pop up with the raise hand button. We'll then call on you when it's your turn and unmute your microphone. If you're joining by phone this evening, you can use star nine to raise your hand. And if you have any technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, either via the chat box, by email at kwhit at somervillema.gov, or by phone at 617-366-7293. So I see six hands raised now. We'll start with Principal Soto, and then we'll go to Reuven. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry, I was having problems unmuting myself. Um, thank you for inviting us to the meeting and for the very informative presentation. I, I really appreciate understanding the scope of the project and the timeline and all that. Um, I, I want to um, make everyone mindful that I'm here in representation of my school community and um, our students. Um, I think our parents and, and those who bike and walk to the Argentiano School have appreciated the priorities of the team in terms of um, you know, making it accessible for, for people who walk and bike. But I think um, some unintended consequences resulted from the changes in, in, in Washington Street during the pandemic time when school was not in section in a normal way. So I want the team to be considerate of that. And I heard Adam saying that um, he would um, come around and collaborate with us uh, so that he can understand better how that works. Um, for my, from my perspective as the school administrator, um, student safety is always my priority. And um, in, in the mornings and in the afternoons, I have seen how the impact of not having parking around the Washington area um, has jeopardized student safety um, because in the past, we have never had to use our roundabout area for um, parkings to come, for, I'm sorry, for cars to come through for drop off and pick up, but because there is no parking now around the area for parents and staff, we're using that area for people to drop off quickly and, and, um, and pick up in, in, in the afternoons. And um, of course, with students walking, parents biking, and all that happening at the same time, it has, in, in a sense, jeopardized um, student safety. And if we don't have an administrator um, in the roundabout area in the morning and the afternoon, it can get really complicated. Um, so I, I would love for the team to join us in the mornings and in the afternoons and look at it more and maybe explore some options about regulations that can be changed around um, Washington when school is in session for the morning and the afternoon that could potentially help ease um, the issues that we're currently having. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to watch every morning and afternoon how things unfold in the area. And um, for my, from the perspective of my staff, I have staff, I have, a, you know, a team of between 90 to 100 staff members, and I would say about 85 to 90 percent of them do not reside in Somerville. So I, I myself live in Pivity, so I have to travel every every morning, and I'm lucky to have a parking space in, within the roundabout, but it's not the same for all staff members. So, um, you know, it's 90 to 100, accommodating 80 to 90 people a day around the area can be really hard and some days our staff members have to 
um, go around the neighborhood 30 to 45 minutes to find parking. So I hope that the team can come up with creative ideas on how maybe changing regulations around the area of Washington Street that will help ease the parking situation for our staff and for our parents so that drop off and um, dismissal can, um, can be in a better way and um, student safety can be uh, prioritized. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Principal Soto. Um, so we have seven hands raised. Um, next, we have Reuven, followed by Aaron, and then Stephanie. Reuven, I will unmute you now. Hi, thank you so much to the team for uh, putting together this effort and for taking the time for this meeting. Um, I am a resident on Washington Street and a relatively frequent um, cycle commuter uh, down towards Harvard Square. Um, I am really excited by the prospects for improved bicycle facilities in the long term. Um, I'm also a bit concerned about the time frame of this project and wondering if there are um, plans to improve the, the smoothness of the surface um, just to, to fix all the potholes in the road that um, constitute a more uh, immediate uh, safety impediment for a lot of cyclists. Um, or this is more going to be like we're going to leave the road exactly as it is until everything is lined up. Yeah, so I can take the first stab at that one, unless you'd prefer to, Brian. Uh, I think the, no, I can answer. It's a, I think it's a pretty quick answer. Uh, so in general, we're not going, we can't fiscally justify paving or doing a skim coat or a surface coat before a major roadway repavement project. And yes, we are aware that the, the condition of West Washington is, is poor in large part because of the utilities construction that was done over the past couple of years. Um, the, the, the best and most prudent thing for us to do right now is with yours and the rest of the community's help, um, uh, work with our DPW for their pothole patrol to be able to clean up the worst areas on the street. Um, but any full repaving of the street um, should and will wait for the full reconstruction in the next couple of years. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Ruben. Next, we have Aaron, um, followed by Stephanie. And I think we still have a, yeah, you know, we have a total of five hands. So Aaron, I'll unmute you now. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to the whole team for this process. Um, I live on off, just off Washington Street um, on a road that, you know, dead end. So I have to use Washington Street every day. And I, I do love the street. I walk on it. I bike on it daily. I also occasionally drive and take the bus on it. Um, I just want to share that the, the changes that were installed in 2020 have been actually really life-changing for me, um, allowed me to ride my bike on the street and feel much more comfortable um, in the areas that are protected. Um, I've just noticed that the um, areas that are unprotected are still feel quite dangerous to me and feel quite uncomfortable to me. Um, I've also noticed that the protected areas have, have allowed for snow plowing much better and are often really clear and the areas that are unprotected often just fill up with snow during a storm like we have today. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to hopefully seeing, you know, continuous protected bike lanes across the stretch of road. Um, you know, also definitely I've noticed the walking experience being quite difficult um, at the moment with um, a lot of raised sidewalk panels that um, I've tripped on or, um, you know, areas without curb cuts that, um, you know, for someone with a mobility issue, which I don't have, but um, plenty of people do, would be very difficult to, to navigate on this street. Um, so really looking forward to see some improvements for, for both walking and biking. Um, you know, this is a really a street that's a really important connection between um, the network on Beacon Street of, of bike lanes and great sidewalks and Austin Somerville Ave and Cambridge's planned um, connection to Harvard Square on Kirkland Street. So um, this is really an essential corridor that I um, um, really hope to see um, in the long term um, or in, in the short term, I should say, the near term have um, improvements that will make it better than it is today. Um, and also, we you know, as, as there are um, opportunities for the short-term improvements, we'd love to definitely see those, uh, a crater opened up, I think crater is an appropriate word, <laughs> opened up in the intersection of um, uh, Dane and Washington in the last couple of days. And it's, it's you know, maybe 
at least eight or eight or ten inches deep and quite big across. Um, so we'd love to see kind of things like that at least um, patched up for the meantime as much as they can be um, before kind of these these improvements happen. But thank you all for your time tonight. Thanks, Aaron. So next we have Stephanie followed by Scott, and I think we have a total of um, five raised hands. So Stephanie, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two kids and they both uh, have gone to Treehouse Academy. So my youngest is there now. And um, it's been really amazing to get there by bicycle on Beacon. But when I try to get over to Perry Park or to Lincoln Park, I just, I can't take my kids on that stretch. Um, it's too dangerous uh, without protected bike facilities. So at the same time as I want to talk about that, I want to also say that like the best thing that Somerville can do to plan for climate change mitigation, I think is the buses and priorit prioritizing um, the movement of bus riders so that more people take the bus, um, which will then reduce the parking demand. And, you know, I, so I have two kids, right? I have a huge amount of climate anxiety and when I see those articles in the New York Times about how we're not doing enough, we're not doing enough, like every single decision that we make on a grassroots level is going to be part of what our future looks like. So I really think that we need to do whatever we can to prioritize uh, low carbon mobility. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, next, we have Scott followed by Ian with a total of four hands raised. Scott, I'll unmute you now. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so just three quick points that I wanted to call out. Um, one, uh, again, echoing, uh, appreciating the bike facilities that have been added to Washington Street, uh, but just calling out that currently from Somerville, north of sort of the train tracks, there's no low stress protected bike route to Harvard Square. Um, this has just been become apparent to me because I'm currently taking a class in Harvard Square uh, and sort of you know, it's Prospect Street or Washington Street or Mass Ave. And so Washington Street does seem like our best opportunity to create a, a good connected um, route there. So just wanted to call that out real quick. Uh, and it does dovetail with the you know, Cambridge Bike Network plan nicely as well. Um, two was, I don't know the Argenziano drop-off situation that was obviously commented on earlier, but uh, I did want to call out that I live near the uh, Capuano Early Childhood Center. And there's a lot of, like at drop-off time, there seems to be a lot of sort of traffic and conflict between bike drop-offs and car drop-offs. So if there's any kind of way that that can be separated for the safety of both, uh, that's probably something to be considered. Um, and then, um, oh, and then the last point was just, since this is going to be a long construction project, uh, I would love to see some thought put into uh, safe detour routes for folks biking and walking as well, um, which I think is something that can get overlooked a lot uh, looking at Union Square and Somerville Ave. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, so next we have Ian followed by Alex Cox followed by Alex Frieden. Um, I see a total of four hands raised. So Ian, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, thank you. Uh, so uh, good timing for me. Uh, as a full disclosure, I am a member of the Centerville Bicycle Advisory Committee. I am speaking tonight on behalf of my six-year-old kindergartner who attends the Argentina School as well as my almost four-year-old who will maybe go to preschool there next year, kindergarten, definitely the year after. Uh, currently, my kids either walk to school, bike themselves. My six-year-old will ride her own bike, lock it up. Uh, by the way, we need more bike racks if, if that we can add this in uh, at the Argentina School for this project. Um, and just the number of parents doing absolutely crazy things by the Argenziano school, including just parking the bike lane saying, oh, I just gotta get my kids to school. And it's like, well, what do you think we're doing? We're not out for a bike ride on Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, just for fun. We're trying to get to school. And the best way that I can think to teach my kids how to be self-sufficient, to respect the environment, to just do the best they can to be part of this community is to get to school without driving. And we live less than a mile from school. We should be walking to school. We should be biking to school if you really need maybe taking the bus. Uh, <clears throat> I understand some parents will have to drive for extenuating circumstances, but I would love if we could try as hard as we can to really 
discourage parents dropping off children at school because the entire point, my understanding, I've only been uh, you know, with the kindergarten here for less than a year, but my understanding is this is a neighborhood school and you shouldn't be driving to your neighborhood school. You should be walking, biking, taking the bus. Um, we do need to accommodate cars. Um, perhaps the circle works, perhaps parents need permits, whatever. There's a bunch of side streets that could work for the older children that for some reason aren't walking themselves to school. Um, but just, I do bike with my daughter to school. She's riding her own bike. I'm basically right on top of her. I don't like how much conflict there is. And I would love to see that resolved in some way. And if everyone just got along and did the right thing, people wouldn't park in the bike lanes, we'd be fine. Um, people just do what's best for themselves. And it's really frustrating. And it's a great lesson in how to not be a good uh, civically minded individual. So that's all I've got. Thanks, Ian. So next we have Alex Cox, followed by Alex Frieden, followed by Richard Clancer. Alex, I'm going to unmute you now. Thanks, Kate. And uh, thanks to the rest of the project team uh, for taking the time uh, to present to us tonight. Um, I'm a, a resident of uh, Western Washington Street near the Dane Street intersection and just want to echo all of the uh, support for the pedestrian uh, improvements and uh, uh, better uh, protected bike facilities um, on this section of Washington Street. Um, I kind of just wanted to call out or bring forward uh, the potential for um, improvements to the, uh, the bus stops for the 86, uh, particularly at uh, Beacon um, and, uh, and at, at the Dane Calvin intersection um, that could potentially be part of this uh, reconstruction, either adding uh, uh, like extended uh, bus lanes and, and queue jumps at, at either of those intersections or, or maybe moving the bus stop to the far side of the intersection. Um, currently, there's a lot of delay um, on, on those two, for those two stops because they're only about uh, 200 yards apart and, uh, um, and the bus will usually not be able to make the light after uh, stopping to uh, drop off passengers or won't be able to um, pull back uh, into traffic after dropping off because uh, drivers won't won't let it back in. So um, just uh, if there's any kind of uh, priority we could uh, give to the 86, uh, particularly at those intersections um, as part of this project, then that would be really great. Thank you and thanks again. Thanks, Alex. Um, next, we have Alex Frieden. Alex, I'm going to unmute you now. Thanks, Kate. Um, uh, so just um, uh, I, I was one of the organizers for the initial pilot of this. So I, I have a, quite a number of thoughts on this project, uh, which I will go through. So I, uh, a number of years ago, I was hit pretty bad at the line in Washington um, by a car that was parking and blocking uh, intersection. You know, we have legislation in Somerville to no parking within 20 feet. It is anything but respected for most of the city. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think one of the best things we can do is design around uh, the safe accommodations. And oftentimes these are around, um, you know, the dangerous parts are the intersections. Uh, I have two daughters at Trias Academy, similar to Stephanie who talked earlier, um, and our oldest is planning on going to Argenziano. I live right off of Washington Street. Um, I, uh, I, we've seen a Safe Routes to School program at Argenziano have fantastic numbers in terms of kids walking or biking with or without parents. Uh, you know, I think those, I hope to see that those numbers can continue to go up because uh, it's, it's really a, uh, uh, our way of combating the obesity crisis we see in America today. Um, you know, I, when we did this pilot, we didn't do anything between Dane and Line Street. And I think that was, in hindsight, a mistake because uh, we really didn't see how that kind of functioned. And, uh, you know, I, but it without, and as Adam mentioned earlier, we will, we hope to see a much, we won't see as good a ridership with just partial facilities. Um, and it is, you know, the mo one of the most critical junctions between K Harvard Square, the Beacon Street, Hampshire Street um, corridor, and Union Square, all of which are huge um, cyclist destinations. 
Um, uh, comment on uh, protecting the turn at Webster and Washington near Gracie's Ice Cream. This is a kind of risky uh, mixed uh, mixing zone that I think many people have almost had near misses or hits there, including myself. Um, bollards are long since destroyed on this on this street. Um, uh, a number of the city's advisory committees have have put in requests for uh, precast concrete curbs that have worked wonders in Boston and do function in other places like Montreal for uh, places that are winter cycling cities. And um, there was a comment Adam made on need to accommodate today's demands. I I would like to challenge that notion that we should be building the street towards this the city we want, not necessarily the needs we see today. We as as previously mentioned, we're seeing a huge change in in what uh, the street needs to accommodate anyway with the pandemic and work from home. So I, I, I really would ask us to take a second look at that need. Um, at the time of the pilot, we talked about trying to come up with better ways to incentivize uh, members of the school, uh, staff of the school to um, have some stipend or some other way that incentivizes non-personal non driving. I don't know if that was ever pursued, but I, I think it's worth city staff and the, uh, the team at the leadership team at the school at Ardenziano to take a second look at that. Um, and as another commenter said, uh, the IPCC report from the UN around climate change effects, it came out two days ago. It is, we are A, not going fast enough and the effects are far worse than we thought. We should be doing everything in our power to setting a setting leadership here to that we can be doing a living low carbon emission lives. Um, and this, this project is uh, ripe for that. So thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. So we have two more hands raised. We have Richard and then John. Richard, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi there. First of all, I want to say um, thank you uh, very much for <clears throat> sort of organizing uh, this pro this um, process. And I want to. So I am. I live just off Washington Street. Uh, I live on Dane Avenue. Um, so I can only. So when traveling by car, I can only access it from Washington Street because I'm on a one-way street. Uh, but almost all of the time, I'm on foot or uh, riding a bike or walking with my kids to the Argenziano School. I have two daughters there in the second and fourth grades. Um, and I want to re, uh, I think of all the things that have been said, I want to reiterate any comments about uh, planning for the, planning for what we want to have and not working around what may be there now. So, and specifically with respect to the school, um, there are, of course, a number of parents that, for various reasons, do uh, drop off their children by bike, uh, excuse me, by car. And I've seen certainly them uh, using the circle, which was forbidden a couple of years ago. Um, and, of course, sometimes blocking the lane um, in the street. And the key point about that is that operations and behavior can change over time. Um, they can change. I know at a moment's notice with operations, behavior can change from year to year. But once we build the infrastructure and set the expectations, um, we can make operations and behavior change to meet what we uh, to meet what we've built and to make it work. Um, so, for example, you can imagine using drop-offs at any number of the areas around Lincoln Park, et cetera, um, and doing more outreach to organize either uh, group walks or um, or just to discourage uh, um, car use there. But, uh, and then my one other thing is I actually have a question, uh, which is whether it is feasible in this project um, to have curbs that uh, like to extend the curb for a raised protected bike lane. So there was a discussion. Uh, so in one of the questions, you said that the curb couldn't be moved now, but I took that, I took the initial description only to mean that the curb couldn't be, the sidewalk couldn't be decreased, but could a curb be moved out to have a raised lane is one of the questions, or could a barrier of some other type be created? 
like the third option in that picture. Uh, yeah, so I can I can chime in on that, Richard. Um, and I'd anticipate a question like this, uh, clearly, because uh, this is, I include this here in our appendix. Um, we, because this is, um, because we're kind of working the design into the budget and not vice versa, where we're designing it right. first and then building the budget to that, I don't want to commit us to saying that we can build uh, a fully raised separated bike line if that's the direction we choose to go as part of this project. However, I think um, it could be something like the third option here. And I think that's what we would strive for if that's the direction we're going at a minimum, um, because something like this doesn't require a whole lot of utility drainage rework, but it's definitely more substantial uh, than flex posts. And I think we're also, um, you know, unless there's a, a, a need for it that we haven't yet determined, I think we would we would even go for something like the third option here over the mountable. So I think that is that, if that's the direction we go in, in terms of having dedicated continuous bike facilities, um, you know, I think where we need to or we can uh, get the fully race separated, uh, we will try to do so. Um, and if not, I think it could be some version of three, maybe one or two, depending on how it goes. But that's the kind of thing that once we get a design direction, we're going to have to figure out um, what we have the budget to do. Wonderful. I'll assume that any kind of change to the bridge is out of the question. So for example, the uh, bike lane there is elevated significantly above the sidewalk, but I suspect that it's just out of the budget to lower that surface to the sidewalk level. Yeah, the bridge actually isn't um, even city owned as far as I'm aware. So I'm not sure we have right. the ability to touch the bridge as part of this project other than maybe, you know, along the lines of what we've done as part of the pilot or something yeah. similar. That makes sense. And I think the sidewalk there is too narrow to really feasibly put the bike lane in next to the sidewalk, but I'd love to see that considered as an option if it's possible. Thanks, Richard. So folks, we've passed the 7.45 p.m. mark, so I want to make sure to still respect your time this evening. We've got um, two more hands raised, and then we'd love to close it out with next steps. So we'll go John and then Anne. John, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, thanks so much. I'm not John, I'm Julie. Uh, I'm married to John. Um, and uh, my family, we all live on Washington Street, close to the intersection of Beacon Street. I have three questions. Um, one is with a repaved Washington Street. I mean, there's already a speeding problem along Washington Street to begin with. With a smoother surface, we can only expect that there will be faster cars, faster bikes, faster buses, faster trucks. So um, I know this is a construction project, but this is a construction project in a community. Uh, what is the city's plan to help control speeding and ticket speeding uh, to make it a safe environment for our families and all of us to, uh, to walk around? That's my first question. My second question uh, for the bike lanes, we, I've noticed that um, the, the, stoplights for bikes in Cambridge Street, uh, or not in Cambridge Street, excuse me, in Cambridge, um, uh, particularly along Washington Street, for example, uh, not Washington Street, excuse me, Western Avenue, for example, um, is the city considering, is the, consider, is the city considering installing those along Washington Street to help the flow of traffic, both bicycle, uh, including bicycles? And lastly, since we are at the, uh, intersection close to the intersection of Washington and Beacon, the Beacon project took three, four years to complete. What has the city learned from that experience so we can ensure that this project doesn't have a similar fate? Thank you. Kate, I can take a, a stab at a couple of those questions and I might ask Brian to chime in on the third, if he's still here. Um, so to answer your first question, Julie, uh, with repaving, will traffic be faster? Yes, uh, that is actually something that we've um, we've measured uh, in on other street projects as part of these projects. Not not necessarily significantly, but I think with in particular with Western Washington Street, given the current state, we would definitely see um, 
people of all modes going faster on that new surface. And so as part of these projects, we have started to um, sort of fold in an expectation that there will be traffic calming along the corridor. And in fact, um, the uh, sort of the previous generation of this project uh, over on College Ave, um, or the, the, we'll call it the 2021 version, uh, it's not quite complete yet, but we will be installing uh, vertical traffic calming elements to ensure that speeds uh, are maintained at a, uh, a safe level or as safe as we can expect and really design the street around that and lean on the street design uh, to do sort of a, a self-enforcing of, um, of traffic speeds. So uh, that, that's our plan there. And so, uh, like I said, there's, there's a, a big caveat as to exactly what we're doing at this point, just because we want to figure out what design direction we're going in. And that's going to have to be uh, tailored to fit within the budget. But we do have um, plans uh, to install traffic calming. Um, and we'll come back to everyone with a proposal for that. So uh, number two, will we be installing bike signals? Um, not as part of this project uh it is that is one of the things that is outside of the scope uh is to make changes to uh traffic control at certain intersection or at any intersection with a project quarter of the scale it's something that we can keep in mind and, and we've been starting to tackle more um sort of at individual locations as we're starting to uh have more of a vested interest in uh signal changes and bike signals and transit signals and all that um all that sort of cool stuff, uh, but it is not currently within the scope of this project. Um, and so if we were to tackle that, it would have to be part of a separate effort. And Adam, the last question was regarding length of time in construction. Yeah, um, and, and, and Julie, that, that, that's a hard question um, <laughs> uh, because uh, the, the, the biggest challenge from my perspective on Beacon Street uh, having also lived through it, uh, is that there were, there was a lot of, I don't want to say poor, but probably not the best coordination going into the construction project. There were many different departments and there was a lot of surprises as construction started going that, oh, there's one other thing that we need to do. Oh, we didn't think to look at this. And one of the things that we have succeeded at in the past uh, three or four years is to really be a lot more proactive. So the engineering division has a really strong program for analyzing all of our utilities. Uh, and we try to make sure that we have analyzed the utilities before we go into a construction project. Um, so that, um, which is something that we did here at Washington Street. We had, we had analyzed the water system. And so we, re, we, we reconstructed and repaired the water system. So that's not gonna be a surprise. Uh, we've also been studying our sewer and drainage systems. Uh, so we already know that the drainage system in Washington Street is in a condition that doesn't need to be repaired. Um, and that the flooding repairs that we're, or the flooding improvements we're gonna do won't be in Washington Street itself. And we've also been very proactive with the gas companies uh, to, to make sure that they're coming in and, uh, and letting us know what their long-term uh, repair plans are. And we're also reciprocating, telling them what our long-term pavement uh, plans are so that we can coordinate them. So, and, and this is another example where we've been able to do that, where we've been able to make sure that the gas company came in uh, before uh, our planned reconstruction of the street. So uh, the, uh, of course we don't know what we don't know. And I would hate to say that we've uh, managed to avoid every um, uncertainty, but we've done our due diligence to minimize that risk to the extent that we can. Folks are approaching the 7.55 p.m. mark. I um, wanna make sure to respect your time. So we've got two more spoken comments. If you can um, kind of uh, keep it brief and then we can make sure to get you all out on time. So next we have Ann Grippenberg followed by Ann Kamara. Hi, thank you. Uh, Ann Grippenberg and I am actually a Boston resident. 
my office is in Kendall and I have uh, quite a few friends who live in Somerville. So I'm in Somerville very frequently. And I always drive. I always drive. I'm like probably a 20 minute bike ride. Uh, I have an e-bike, so hills are no big deal, but I do not feel safe on the roads and with the traffic and the speeding and uh, without a separated protected bike, bike network. You know, I'm someone who takes climate change very seriously, but I, I will not risk my life. And, and I just, I, I would bike every day if I could. I, I bike in the winter. Weather's not a concern as long as the, the paths are clear, but it has to be made safe and it has to be a network. So I'm just putting my voice in there as someone who wants to be part of the solution and not the problem. Uh, the other thing I just wanna say is uh, one of my friends who lives in Somerville, she uses a mobility chair. And when you build these lanes uh, that aren't uh, bumpy sidewalks, but are paved rolling surfaces, it doesn't matter. Anyone can use them at that point. It can be a kid with a little scooter, a skateboard. It can be my friend who's disabled and uses a mobility chair. It can be bike people on bikes. It can be people on cargo bikes with their kids. So it, if you put that space separate from the cars, you make it safe, you're going to enable so much more transportation. So I just wanted to put my pitch in for that because, uh, you know, we we really are heading towards a very extreme climate crisis. And the, the, for the folks who have the kids and talk about what their children will see, it's it's going to be a very different world if we don't act. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. Next, we have Anne Kamara. Anne, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, good evening. Uh, just a couple of ideas. So I, I, I came on late. I apologize. If we talked about uh, putting the wires underground, the Eversource wires or the cable wires underground or behind, um, do you know that there are grants, FEMA grants, to do this? Um, I wanted to mention that because we would love to be like uh, Highland and, you know, Broadway and, and some of the labs and have flowers and wreaths. But um, the other thing is, you know, I, I, I read a lot about buses and it gets a person to work fast, only five minutes faster. I, I really am not in favor of the bus lanes. Um, if we do do a bus line, if it's insisted, do we, can we just put that the bus is the AM, like on Mystic Ave, um, and not all day, um, that the, the, you know, but I do absolutely um, believe in um, bike lanes and for the lights and everybody on the bikes to be safe. I'm a car driver because I have a handicap, um, but, um, when the when it's so narrow um when you are driving it's very frightening that you're going to hit the other car or the or the mirror or something but but i think the bu taking the bus lane out would be best but um is there any way we could do the uh just the am bus it's an option it's on the table um so we were considering something like that over on um, Holland Street and College Ave, actually. Um, and I think we ended up hearing that uh, there was a general preference from the community, at least over in West Somerville, that they would prefer shorter full-time bus lanes over longer ones that are just for certain hours of the day. Because as soon as you have one car park in that unknowingly, if you don't have someone out there to enforce it and tow it, it becomes... Um, it, it sort of loses uh, its its usability. So we'd have to weigh that against it, um, yeah, but it, it's on the table. It's something we could consider. I see. And what about the wires for the uh, the uh, grants for the wires? Uh, yeah, um, and and thank you. I uh, saw your comment in the chat box and I just hadn't made okay. it to it yet. Uh, the, uh, so thank you for bringing it up. Uh, it So we are aware of the grants. Um, they're, they can be challenging to get, and we have to have Eversource's um, agreement to do that uh, and proceed with that. And I think they even have to be the applicant for it. Uh, so I'm not so sure how uh, relevant that will be to our specific case, uh, but we have been working with Eversource uh, about just a general plan and a general concept um, of how this could be achieved. Uh, but we haven't yet got to a point where uh, we have a realistic path forward to uh, putting overhead utility lines underground. 
I see. Thank you. Well, everyone, thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate you giving a couple hours this evening to come and listen and um, discuss with us. We want to share a couple of next steps. Um, there is a project website for all information regarding this project. It's at somervillema.gov slash Western Washington Street. On this project website sits what will be soon a feedback survey. So some of those questions that we asked today in the polls that will all be available along with some additional questions. We'll also email this to you in the coming days. So you can check the project website or you can wait for an email from me in your inbox. If you can also begin to add your comments later this week to a tool called a public input map. Essentially, this looks similar to a Google map, but you could put a pin on it and add a variety of comments, specifically in the location that you're discussing. And if you have any questions or comments, never hesitate to reach out to us at transportation at somervillema.gov. The recording from this meeting will be available on the project website along with the presentation slides. And again, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you all so much, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Councillor Scott, do you want to jump in too? I just wanted to reiterate that. Thanks for everybody coming. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, the feedback here. And I think one of the main takeaways I heard was there was a lot of support for uh, getting the street rehabilitated in the very short time frame. So, um, you know, I look forward to working both with residents and with members of staff to come up with a uh, with a plan that we can bring back to another community meeting um, and, then, and then move forward with a bid package. So if you do have any other feedback, again, uh, please do go to this website, uh, but also don't be a stranger. I'm just down the street from you. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening.